Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective, as usual. Um, and tonight, on this lovely Sunday evening, I thought that we would talk about Upeksha, uh, otherwise known as Upeka, if you're used to the Pali pronunciation of the word, the idea of equanimity. That's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, as usual, I have a lot to share about this word, upeksha, about the idea of equanimity. And if all goes according to plan, we'll get back to our sutra and we're going to read a little bit about this idea of equanimity. Um, but before we kind of get to that, because if you've been coming to the Dharma doors, you know that the sutra that we're working on, it's kind of, it's an intense sutra. It's a very kind of dense Dharma. Um, and so before we kind of get back into that, let's talk about Upeksha. So this, of course, it's an idea that I'm kind of, I, it's unlike a few Sundays lately where I've been choosing some pretty obscure terms, the idea of upeksha should be pretty common to everybody, but nonetheless, I'm going to go through it in the normal way that I would. Um, so let's start with, I guess, let's start with some language. So this word upeksha actually has a kind of, I wouldn't say that it has a broad sort of definition, but it has a broad interpretation of what it means. So I, I use this term equanimity. You know, um, the, the translation that you might find, even, even in a dictionary, like even in a Sanskrit dictionary or even a Buddhist Sanskrit dictionary, you might find upeksha defined as indifference. And I'm not the biggest fan of indifference. I have to tell you, though, that if you look in like the Vedas and the Upanishads, those kind of early Sanskrit religious texts or philosophical texts, yeah, it, it does sort of seem as if this word upeksha means something like indifference, a very kind of... Um, stoic uh, neutrality in that way. And here's the thing about it. This is going to be one of those words or one of those ideas that is not a, a Buddhist word. The Buddhists use it. The Buddhists have um, kind of adopted it in that way. But un unlike a term like nirvana, which it's like the Buddha was like the only sort of person talking about nirvana as this kind of cessation of uh, suffering in that sense. So unlike a term like nirvana, which the Buddha sort of made up or used, upeksha is around, but the Buddhists and the Buddha uses it in a slightly different way. And so I kind of want to talk about that. Before though, before we dive into that, I do want to kind of address that the talk tonight, this idea of upeksha, I think it's a really great example of what's great about Buddhism. <laughs> and what I mean by that is there's a lot of the, they, they talk about it a little bit more, actually more in the early suttas, so the Pali canon, but you'll find the, the Buddha sort of, well, let me put it to you this way. There's various sutras where people have problems, different types of problems, but different problems. And they go to different people, you know, different uh, forest dwelling masters and master yogis and these people, and they ask sort of about how to solve their problem. And, you know, one person will say, 
oh, you know, well, if you do this and you do this and you make all of the right offerings and all perform all the right rituals in your next life, <laughs> you'll have this, 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 and that. <laughs> and the person goes, okay, that's great for my next life, but you have anything that could, you know, work here and now? So they go to a different teacher who also says, oh, you got to do this, you got to do that. And if you do that in, you know, a hundred years, you could relieve, you know, whatever the problem is. <laughs> and one by one, a situation like this is that people go to all of these different teachers and everybody's offering relief or liberation or whatever at some future time. And then they'll go to the Buddha and what the Buddha will say or what the Sutta will say is that the Dharma, the teachings of the Buddha, they work here and now. They work immediately. And that idea of the present alleviation of suffering, the present alleviation of problems in that way, of course, eventually within the world of Buddhism leads to this debate about uh, sudden and gradual enlightenment. And like the very idea that you could even get like fully enlightened in the present moment. I'm not, I'm not talking about getting fully en enlightened tonight. <laughs> I'm not talking about getting fully enlightened at all, but I am talking about this really nice thing about the Dharma, about the teachings of the Buddha, which is that it's all about right now. It's about what you're doing right now. It's about how you're thinking right now. And it's about things that you can do right now to alleviate suffering to kind of solve problems in that sense. And so upeksha, or this idea of, of equanimity that we're going to talk about tonight, it's very much one of those things that it's, it's right here for the having. So unlike nirvana, which may or may not be achievable in an instant or even in an evening, something like Upeksha is achievable right here, right now. And there's a sense in which if you practice and practice kind of developing this, you could be in it all the time. So let's talk about that idea. So because of the way these, um, or actually because of the way the sutra has been going, I'm going to use this as an opportunity to talk about, as usual, this shouldn't be a surprise, but I'm going to talk about early Buddhism, what is kind of referred to as the Hinayana versus the Mahayana. I've been doing this a lot. Again, it's sort of part of our sutra that we make this distinction. And so the practice of cultivating Upeksha has been a part of the Buddhist tradition from the beginning. And as I mentioned at the start, it's not a uniquely Buddhist idea. And so I wanna share with you one of the early examples of the cultivation of Upeksha. Um, this is a story, it's a Buddhist story that I often tell. So some of you may have heard this already, but in the early Buddhist tradition, there's a story about a group of monks who were in a wood, who were in the forest, and they were trying to meditate. They were trying to calm down and do a shamatha, calming exercise. But there were these darn yakshas up in the trees, these uh, tree spirits. So yakshas are spirits, nature spirits, they're usually tree spirits, although I, you do sometimes see uh, river yakshas and mountain yakshas, but they are nature spirits. And these particular tree yakshas, these tree spirits, they were being really loud. 
they were being very disturbing. And so the monks went to the Buddha and said, Buddha, we can't meditate. We can't calm down. We can't focus because of the darn yakshas. And, you know, the, the basic idea is that they were kind of asking, like, can't you get can't you do something, maybe perform a siddhi or perform some sort of superpower? And can't you get the yakshas to quiet down? And the Buddha, rather than agreeing to talk to the yakshas, rather than doing a form of magic to make the yakshas quiet down, the Buddha said, oh, I'll tell you this old practice. And I want to make that clear that in this uh, sutta, in this story, the Buddha says, this is not my teaching. This is a teaching I learned from others. And it's a great teaching. It'll help you with your problem. And what the teaching was is a teaching that is known. I'm not quite sure he refers to it as that in this case, but nonetheless, it's the practice that is known as the four Brahma Viharas. So Brahma is a god and god, a god that lives in heaven or in a heaven. And so these are also sometimes called these four heavenly abodes or abodes of Brahma. So I want to actually talk about Brahma and the abodes of Brahma, but let me walk you through the four abodes really quickly. So the four abodes of Brahma, and you know these, I know, uh, you probably know them, but very quickly what they are is about cultivating metta or loving kindness, karunya or compassion, Mudita, empathic joy, or just joy. And then the fourth Brahma Vihara, the fourth of these cultivations is Upeksha, equanimity. So what the Buddha suggested to the monks was as these yakshas were um, making their ruckus, right? Um, oh, and by the way, just to let you know, I often like to um, relate this story because it's a great story if you have like really loud neighbors <laughs> above you or next to you. And if you're ever trying to meditate and there's like a big party going on next door or above you or what have you, and you're frustrated by the upstairs neighbors because they're disturbing your meditation. They're like the yakshas that were disturbing the monks. And so what the Buddha recommended was the practice of beginning with the other bhikshus, the other monks. So beginning with your friends, beginning with your family, beginning with your sangha, you generate a a sphere of metta. And metta, of course, is usually translated as loving kindness. But I've kind of lately been on this, this kick to really emphasize that metta, metta means friendliness. It, it has become translated as loving kindness which is kind of an extension of just translating it as kindness. But the actual connotation of the word metta or metria is about friendliness. So what we're doing here is we begin this practice by kind of having enemies, if you will which is to say the yakshas are the upstairs neighbors that are sort of, that we're at odds with in that way. So the Buddha suggested cultivating this sort of sphere of friendliness and engulfing your friends or your fr family or your sangha 
though those who you would naturally and normally be friendly towards in other words those for whom it is easy for you to be friendly for for you to have metta or loving kindness for so you begin by with that to sort of prime the pump if you will the idea being that you kind of get into a friendly mood because you are easily embracing your friends and your family in that sphere of friendliness. But then what you do is, is you extend that sphere of friendliness to include the upstairs neighbors. And you really, really extend to those upstairs neighbors friendliness. And when I say extend it, you really put it out there, really be friendly in that in your heart. And in some practices, you could extend that sphere of friendliness even larger to include sort of your entire vicinity and extend it further and include your whole state, your whole country until you've engulfed sort of the whole universe in this sphere of friendliness. Then you would move, the Buddha suggests, to compassion, to karunya. Likewise, beginning with your friends and your families and engulfing them in utmost compassion, but then bringing those yakshas, bringing those upstairs neighbors into the fold of your compassion, and then after compassion, and again, you could extend that all the way out to the universe, but then comes the third Brahma Vihara, Mudita, what is normally translated as this joy, this joy for others. So now, not only are we, the idea is, not only are we not upset with the upstairs neighbors because we have extended them friendliness and compassion, but now in this third Brahma Vihara, you would extend joy, meaning that when we started, if the upstairs neighbors, you know, they were having a party and they were all laughing and dancing. And we were down there trying to meditate. We were all like, mm, like, what, 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 you know, very upset. But now in the third Brahma Vihara, where we have extended that to our family, our friends, and then these upstairs neighbors, now when they laugh, we laugh. When they're happy, we're happy. It's empathic joy, but we are not leaving it there. And that's where you move into the fourth cultivation, the fourth Brahma Vihara, which is the cultivation of this upeksha, this equanimity. And the idea of that state of being equanimous, I would suggest that when we started, the upstairs neighbors were kind of over here. I'm, I'm speaking spatially now. And they were our enemies in that sense that we were, they, that we were up against them in that way. And then through this process, we swing the pendulum all the way to joy, to this, the, the, wow, they're our best friends in that sense. But all of that is to then swing this needle back to the middle. And the idea here is, is now we are sitting neither with this idea of like, they're my friends, but also not my enemies. They, it just is. And this is where it's tempting to translate upeksha as indifference, but it's not really indifference. And so I wanna speak more about that, but I want you to kind of be kind of looking at how 
we started as enemies, swung all the way to where we were partying with them, but it was all to kind of bring it back into this sort of middle zone. And the idea now, if I go back to my original story, now the idea is that the monks can sit in the forest and the yakshas can be as loud as they want and the monks are undisturbed by it. And the, the beauty of this, of course, is that it wasn't that the Buddha made the yakshas quiet down. The Buddha taught the monks how to quiet down. And that's a very subtle but beautiful teaching. Now, I want to say, just to bring us a little deeper to this idea of Upeksha, let's talk about the Brahma Viharas, this idea of the abodes of Brahma. So there's a, a, a something really interesting going on with these ideas of Brahma. So within the pantheon of Indian cosmology, you have various deities or various gods. Some are higher than others or considered higher than others. But one thing that you should know that's kind of, mm, it's just something to really keep in mind when you're hearing about all of this uh, mythology. There's one God named Chakra, also called Indra or Chakra Devanam Indra. That's like their, uh, their full formal name. But Chakra is, yeah, Chakra is the God of the sky. Chakra is the God that wields the Vajra, the lightning bolt or the thunderbolt. Mm, you know, there's a lot I could tell you about Chakra or about Indra, but there's something interesting because, you know, Buddhists, Buddhism is, they talk about these gods, but, you know, they're not interested in becoming gods or bowing to gods. In fact, the gods come and bow to the Buddha in that sense. But what you should know about Chakra, Indra, is that Chakra is the god, the highest god of the realm of desire. Whereas Brahma is the highest god of the realm of form. And I want to talk a little bit about that because that's actually very significant. So if you're not familiar with this idea of the realm of desire versus the realm of form, and I might as well then throw in the third one now, which is the formless realm. If you're not familiar with that structure or that idea of the triple realm, the three realms, we need to talk about it because it has a lot to do with Upeksha. So the thing about it is, is that everything that I was just describing a moment ago about Metta, Karuna, Mudita, and Upeksha, the four Brahma Viharas, what I was just describing all falls within the category of dhyana, dhyana meditation, that particular flavor or that particular type of meditation that the Buddhists call dhyana, which of course the Japanese call Zen, but it's the same word, dhyana, jhana in Pali, chan or chana in Chinese, and then Zen in Japanese. It's all the same idea, though. It's a type of meditation. And so, and of, oh, and by the way, just in case you, you didn't know, the way that you do dhyana, the way that you practice that is doing sati, or also called smrti, which is mindfulness, that kind of fixed focused attention on an object like your breath. So that's the practice, fixed focus attention or sati. And if you do that, you can slip into a dhyanic state. What quantifies 
what qualifies as a dionic state is that one is actually in the realm of form, not the realm of desire, the realm of form. So again, this is all very related to Upeksha. So let me give you an example. I've used this example a lot to walk us through the, the three realms, but I want to show you this one. So the idea here is, is that I'm, I'm showing, you know, I'm showing you something, of course. And the idea is, is that you are, you know, if you're like me, then you probably think that this is a $2 bill. And then there's a lot going on with that idea of it being a $2 bill. But what I want you to be thinking about is how one person could be looking at the screen and could be looking at that and be thinking, you know, I could really use $2. <laughs> you know, they need some money for whatever reason, they need some money. And so if they see this, it might trigger desire. Now, if we looked at it more deeply, of course, we, and actually, of course, somebody might want my $2 bill because, you know, $2 bills are kind of rare. They're kind of interesting. And so there might be a desire just for the actual $2 bill. But in terms of desire, you might actually want, I don't know, you know, you might want a can of soda and it costs a dollar and you could get two, you could get two cans with this. And so the desire is deep because it's a, Yes, you might want this, but you might want what this can buy. You think it's valuable in that way. But I want to remind you that, that somebody else could think that this is the root of all evil. That money and fiat currency and like all of this is, is the devil's business. And so the point is, is that one person could be looking at this and getting all excited and getting all desirous. Another person could see this and be, they don't want it. They want to, they want to tear it up. They want to rid the earth of, of it in that way. And of course, all kinds of other feelings all in between all of that between those very extreme ones of really wanting it or really not wanting it. But the thing about it is, is that, and now this is where, you know, I'll show you this one. This one's a little green rectangle too. It's flat, same proportions. But this piece of green paper, you might be indifferent too, right? Where you don't want it, but you probably don't think that this is the root of all evil either. You might just be observing its form, just its shape, just its size, just its general chromatic scale, what, you know, a color, but you know, we know that color is tricky too. So it's more of just the chromatic scale. Is it light? Is it dark? Is it big? Is it small? But none of that, the size, the shape, the tones, none of that is really worth getting excited about, nor is it really worth getting upset about because it, it just is what it is in that way. Well, the idea here is, is that one could, if you were really on top of your emotional state, you could equally see this as a rectangle, flat, chromatic scale, certain parts are dark, 
certain parts are light, but valuable, it's, it's a rectangle. <laughs> Evil, <laughs> it's a rectangle. It, it, it's just is what it is. Now, the idea here is, is that if you're still seeing a weird $2 bill, if you're still seeing like the money, that's still the realm of desire. You, the mind state that you're in is in the realm of desire. And if you could actually penetrate that delusion, and the delusion is that the value or the evil the delusion is that the value or the evil is out here. When really the judgment and the feeling that this is good or bad is coming from the conditioned mind of the viewer. And so, again, if you could penetrate the delusion of desire in that sense, you could reveal what is right here already, the realm of pure form. It's, it's just a shape. And I kind of leave it up to you, of course, to determine which realm are you in. Are you in a mental state in which you could use some money and therefore this looks desirous to you? Or are you in a deep meditative state where you could care less in that sense? And it just is what it is. Again, I leave that up to you. But here's the idea. One surefire way to get into the realm of form. And let me remind you, the ruler, the ruler of the realm of form is Brahma, Brahma. And so the idea is, is that the four Brahma Viharas are a technique for drawing us out of the realm, the deluded realm of desire and into that more calm meditative state of the realm of pure form, the rupa dattu. And so, you know, it's, it might be silly, of course, to extend loving kindness to the $2 bill, to extend compassion to the $2 bill, joy, only to reach that stage of upeksha. So, it's not so much about extending the $2 bill, metta, karuna, mudita, and upeksha. What it is, though, is about noticing one's desires in that way. Now, desires can run in every direction. Each of us, of course, is different in the way that we desire, what we desire, and how we desire it. So the idea is, is that the development or the cultivation of friendliness, just loving kindness, is a technique for drawing the mind out of such opinionated points of view that are the hallmark of the realm of desire, the kamadatu. And so by cultivating these, beginning with metta, then again, compassion, joy, and then ending with upeksha, upeksha is considered this sort of deepest or highest, you pick the metaphor, but it's the deepest or the highest state of dhyana, of being in the realm of just form, is when you are Upekshik. And upekshik is a term that, you know, it's a kind of a, it's not a real word. It's one of those uh, Sanskrit English words that I make up all the time. But the idea of being upekshik in that sense is that highest state of being just in the realm of form, being completely, again, I want to point something out about this idea of indifference. So the point is, is this. So if I showed you this rectangle with that number and that dude, 
right? The idea is, is that if I then held it up next to that one that had that number uh, symbol that had that dude or whatever, the idea is, is that within the realm of desire, you probably would want this one <laughs> more than you would want that one. In the realm of pure form, though, yes, these are the same size, same color, same shape, same dimensions. But what I want to make clear is, is that within the Buddhist world, a mind that is upekshik, it's not that they don't know that this is a, quote, $1 bill, and this is a $2 bill. And it's not that they have lost sight of the fact that this is mnemonic or numerically more than this one. It's not that they think that this person is no different than that person. They understand the, a mind in, a, in an upekshik state, it understands the difference between these two. But the idea that one is better or more valuable, that's what the mind that is in an upekshik state is not participating in. So I want to make that really clear because there's a sense in which an indifferent mind would sort of see these as interchangeable. And it's not that they're interchangeable. They're different. And within the realm of money, they are different. So Upeksha is about really, really actually respecting difference, respecting that, and actually not elevating one over the other, no matter what it is. So are we doing okay with Upeksha? Yeah, no. Okay. Uh, thanks, Michael. I love everything so far. Um, I'm, I've been thinking actually a lot about indifference versus, uh, I don't know what you would call it, uh, I guess equanimity. Um, but my question is, um, and I don't, for what, for what it's worth, I don't think being indifferent is really the, what we're trying to do here. But, um, but um, my question is about, I've heard a teaching, I've heard teachings about the Brahma Viharas being sort of a continuum of, you could use the word love, um, where, you know, uh, metta is, I guess, a general kind of love, uh, you know, loving kindness, kindness, friendliness, and then uh, compa karuna, compassion is love in the face of suffering of someone, and and then, you know, mudita is love in the face of joy, um, but I'm not sure what then upiksha is in that, um, in that uh, framework, and I, I don't know if you if that framework even, if you think it's a useful framework, but I'm curious what you would say. Um, in general, I appreciate the sentiment that you're mentioning, because I do see, I certainly see Metta as a, a general disposition of friendliness, whereas, whereas Oh, and, and let me say this too, Noam, in, in regards to that. I do see metta as being, how can I put this? Let's think about, let's think about uh, the idea of empathy really quickly. So the third of these, which people call empathic joy, and the reason why they would say empathic joy, because the idea is it's, it's joy for the other person. Mm -hmm. and, and they mention like a parent being joyful that their child has succeeded. Mm -hmm. Even though this success isn't their own, mm -hmm. they're joyful in that way. And if we're thinking about the third of those, mudita, as being like 
empathy, mm -hmm. where, and remember, empathy is where we are really assuming the position of the other. Mm -hmm. Karunya is sort of sympathy. <laughs> And metta is sort of friendliness in that way. And what I'm getting at is, is that there's a process by which we are kind of assuming the position of the other. Mm -hmm. And that process happens initially by just being friendly, because of course the opposite of that is being mean <laughs> in that sense. And so we are friendly. And then that friendliness, as I understand it, kind of cracks open the heart mm -hmm. and then that allows for the compassion mm -hmm. and the compassion as you put it gnome is very much sort of about the appreciating that everybody is suffering in their own way yeah. and that really deep compassion for that and actually understanding that you know basically it's understanding the four noble truths in that way that suffering is a universal problem and we are all have it and so when you kind of through metta through the cracking open of the heart when you can really appreciate that other people suffer that we are not the only ones that suffer and it's not a contest so one suffering isn't more than another but we really are compassionate for the suffering of others that's really getting us open really getting us out of that selfish frame of mind and then that is what kind of opens us up to this full mm -hmm. empathy mm -hmm. and that known to get actually to your question for me that is still about like that we're very rigidly kind of over here in a kind of selfish mode where we just kind of just wallow in our own suffering in that way. And then the pendulum swings all the way this way. And for me, Upeksha is this sort of, yeah, it's, it doesn't, in my experience and in my studies of what this is, it's not that Upeksha loses friendliness, it doesn't that it loses compassion and it doesn't lose the joy. Mm -hmm. So they're all there, but they're just all equaled out in that way. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that totally says anything, Noam, but- That's, that's helpful, thank you. Uh, everything you said was helpful, thank you. Okay. Renata, did you have a question? Um, my dogs are in a bit of a fight right now. But, um, uh, I, I'm still, you know, I think I've really tried in texture when it comes to my loud neighbors who have these very loud parties with bass and I get migraines and um, as long as we're in this physical body, if there's noise. I don't see how I can meditate with a migraine. I mean, I don't know how people got over these uh, yakchas. Um, if they, you know, if they had bass or what in those days, but uh, I, I find that difficult to practice in real life. I guess now, now I'm getting as many as my knees. <laughs> so, Renata, your, your, your question comment there brings up a very good point that I want to make that I would love to make clear about this. So what I'm talking about, what we're talking about tonight is very much in, it, in the realm of kind of uh, call it emotional duress, this sort of being angry at the neighbors, being frustrated by the neighbors and all of that. But my point is, is this, if, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of an example, but the point is, is that if there were some sort of um, physical impingement on your body <laughs> that was like literally causing you physical pain, I, the Buddha, nobody would be suggesting that you need to be more upekshik about that. So I want to make really clear that upeksha is about anger, bitterness, frustration. So all up here 
And so if we're getting to the point that you're describing where it's the actual decibel levels causing an actual physical problem, then that might actually be about removing oneself from that physical thing in the exact same way that if your arm was pinged, it would be about getting your arm out of that problem, not about trying to get more comfortable with it in that position. So I wanna make that really clear that we're talking entirely about heart, mind, emotionality, and not literally physical pain at all, at all, at all, because I'm not a Dharma teacher that encourages pushing through physical pain in that way. Does that? Okay, cool. And Tanya. Yeah, so I was just thinking um, about what you were talking about with um, Noam. Um, and I was just struck by how the three first three Brahma Kibiharas are like about other people. But when you get to Opeksha, that can kind of bring it back to you too. So there's like no preference in terms of compassion, uh, equanimity, uh, in terms of metta, karuna, and mudita between you and what you feel for others. It's like you and them, every, it's just all just, there's no preference. So it kind of, kind of brought me back to like, you know. Yep. So the meditator, does that, that make sense? Makes total sense. I can't help but feel that that's my fault. And what I mean is, is that I, kn I know that I've been wording this in a particular way for a particular reason, and you're picking up on that, which is that because I'm talking about the, I'm still talking about the early Buddhist path, the Hinayana, I'm trying to actually lean towards the idea that the four Brahma Vihara practice, as it was, as it is described in the Pali Canon, that it's sort of much more about one's own cultivation. And what I mean by that is, is that the example of the Yakshas, the example of the upstairs neighbor, it's, it doesn't have anything to do with the upstairs neighbors. It, it has to do with your meditation practice, and the controlling your mind and we meaning the individual has um conditioned desires conditioned resentments and so this is a practice for overturning or getting rid of those conditioned habits in that way and the idea is, is that opeksha is this more peaceful equanimous calm state of being and I didn't want to lead you exactly where you got to, <laughs> which is this way that it comes entirely back to the person, because it's more actually, I think, at least, it, again, in the early tradition, it is still about kind of, well, remember that the realm of pure form, it's very neutral in that sense mm -hmm. and so the point is is that what my 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 real point that i'm kind of saving but we can mention it now is that a real deep state of upeksha like in that really deep fourth dionic state there's an equanimity between inside and outside and so that, as far as the meditator goes, is a very different meditator. Yeah. Than, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. Um, and thanks for the great segue, because now I do want to segue more into the Mahayana idea of the Brahma Viharas. So interestingly, in the Pali Canon, in the early Buddhist teachings, you really only find the four Brahma Viharas. You really only find them here and there. And they, again, they are sort of described as a, mm, you know, like if you're having trouble just focusing, just doing sati, you could do this practice. 
But actually within the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, the four Brahma Viharas become the foundational bodhisattva practice of doing dhyana. Meaning that when you read Mahayana sutras and they start talking about doing dhyana, they're going to immediately go to the four. Well, they don't always call them the four Brahma Viharas. And that's where I want to introduce this other way of thinking about these. So in the Mahayana tradition, they usually refer to these as the four immeasurables, also sometimes referred to as the four immeasurable mind states. <clears throat> and the practice is basically exactly the same. It's about generating a sphere of friendliness, starting with people that you're already friendly with, extending it to the people that you're not friendly with, and eventually extending it to everybody, also with compassion, also with mudita or joy, and finally developing and cultivating upeksha. The thing about it is, is that, and this shouldn't be a surprise, the bodhisattva path is basically the same as the early path except that one difference. The Bodhisattva does this practice of metta, karuna, mudita, and upeksha, not for their own improvement, not for their own cultivation. They do it as part of that Bodhisattva vow, which is to benefit all sentient beings. And so at that point, the practice isn't about, oh, I can't stand my neighbors, and so I'll do this practice so I can stand them. It's actually about recognizing, oh, if I'm mad at my neighbors, I'm not a very good neighbor. What could I do to be a better neighbor? Ah, I could practice the four immeasurable mind states. And just to give you a little taste, one of the reasons, there's many, but one of the reasons why these are called the four immeasurables is because the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, one of the, like, I've never, I don't think I've mentioned this, at least I have not mentioned it lately if I have, but a part of the Bodhisattva vow that you often hear you hear it in monasteries a lot and things like that, but you hear the idea that the Bodhisattva makes the vow that sentient beings are infinite. I vow to save them all. <laughs> the Dharma teachings are infinite. I vow to learn them all. And then the afflictions are infinite. I vow to end them all. So the idea is, is that within the Mahayana framework, the way that the Bodhisattva is thinking, in, there are infinite numbers of sentient beings, incalculable numbers of sentient beings, immeasurable numbers of sentient beings. And so the Bodhisattva is definitely not sitting there thinking, I extend this loving kindness to all Californians. <laughs> I extend this to all people. <laughs> no, this is to all sentient beings. <laughs> and when they say sentient beings, they mean all sentient beings. And they're infinite. So all of a sudden, when you're doing the meta, Karuna Mudita Upeksha practice, but there is no end to your sphere. <laughs> your sphere just keeps growing and growing and growing and growing in that way. And the idea is, is that the Bodhisattva doesn't do this for like an hour once a week. <laughs> this is something that is being cultivated all the time in that way. So 
at that point, the Bodhisattva practice, again, while it, it looks the same on paper, <laughs> in practice, it's a very, very different mentality. Again, because it's, it, it's all about extending it to other people. It's not about the self at all in that way. So, all right, everybody feeling okay with the, that Bodhisattva aspect? Cool. So let's read a little bit from the sutra. We're, we're well primed now because this is, of course, a Mahayana sutra about the Bodhisattva path. Um, I'm pretty sure, yeah, um, Tanya put the link for the sutra in the chat. If you're on the 84,000 website, which is where I'm at least one of the versions of the sutra is, we're starting here with uh line 1.179 so so you know um before we get into that though i want to remind us where we're at so this has been a long sutra i'm not going to go through the whole story of the sutra it's been it's taken us a long time to get here but where we are is in this really intense conversation dialogue that's going on between the Bodhisattva Manjushri, whose sutra it is, he's sort of the star of the sutra, and a, Bodhi, sorry, and a Bodhisattva named uh, Thunderous Voice, something like that, a lion-like thunderous voice, something to that effect. And this bodhisattva thunderous voice started by asking Manjushri the question, when will you attain enlightenment? That was the bodhisattva's question, at least one of his most recent questions. And Manjushri just lays into this bodhisattva. And he lays into this bodhisattva about thinking in terms of the arising and the ceasing of dharmas. And I did a whole talk, I think last week, about this idea of non-arising, anupata, so not dharmas not arising and ceasing in that way. And the idea is, is that if things don't arise, then they don't cease. It's not going like that. And so that puts everything in a different frame. So when the Bodhisattva says, hey, Manjushri, when are you going to be enlightened? When are you going to become a Buddha? Even thinking about it that way, Manjushri says, I don't think about it that way. He says, I'm not even moving towards enlightenment let alone ever going to achieve it. And so this goes on for a while, and Manjushri eventually comes down to this idea that awakening, bodhi, enlightenment, is basically kind of like space, which is actually that third realm, the formless realm. That's basically the realm of space, infinite space. And so he basically says, ultimately, awakening is like empty space. Empty space doesn't come or go. And so it's not something to be arrived at at some future time. So the Bodhisattva's first question was about the future. When will you attain enlightenment? Once that doesn't work out, <laughs> And then the Bodhisattva asks this, and this is where we're at in the text. The Bodhisattva, uh, uh, Mahasattva, powerful lion voice, then asked Manjushri, Manjushri, how long ago did you develop the mindset on awakening, on Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi? supreme unsurpassable awakening so 
now the, the Bodhisattva is asking about the past, not about when will you attain enlightenment, but when did you first generate the bodhicitta, the, uh, the mind headed towards enlightenment? And Manjushri replies, noble one, hush. <laughs> Do not entertain such conceptualizations. Noble one, whoever claims I develop the mind set on awakening or I will practice for the sake of all sentient beings. One who thinks like that develops a gravely wrong view. Noble one, Manjushri says, I don't set any mind on awakening. Consequently, as I do not see such a mind, I have not directed it towards awakening. Okay, so I just remembered, not really crazy about that translation. <laughs> Let me grab the better one. Okay, so So let me read. So you also, everybody knows it's the same sutra we're reading is in this book as well, translated from the Chinese rather than Tibetan. Let me read that again, different translator, different source text. I find this one a little bit uh, clearer. So then the Bodhisattva, lion thundering voice, asked Manju Shri, how long ago did you engender Bodhicitta? Manju Shri answers, Stop, noble one, don't entertain such delusive thoughts. In regard to the Dharma, which does not arise, if someone says, I generated bodhicitta, or I perform, perform the deeds of enlightenment, that person holds a very wrong view. Noble one, I do not see any mind which is engendered to seek enlightenment. Because I see neither mind nor enlightenment, I engender nothing. Bodhisattva lion of thundering voice asks Manjushri, what do you mean by seeing no mind? Manjushri answers, noble one, seeing no mind means equanimity. Bodhisattva lion of thundering voice asked further, why do you say it means equanimity? All right, and now <laughs> we're going to read one more to get the full effect. So let me, this is from my translation of the same source text, same Chinese. Manjushri says, don't even think that way, right? One should not give rise to such deluded thoughts. If regarding the non-arising of dharmas, if someone says, I generate bodhicitta, or I practice enlightening practices, this is a greatly erroneous view. Noble one, the I part does not see there being any mind generating awakening. Because there is no seeing mind or seeing awakening, for that reason, there is no generating. Lion Courage asks, Manjushri, the part that doesn't see, what does that mean? Manjushri says, noble one, it is the part that does not see that is explained as being called equanimity. 
And then Lion Courage asks, what is explained as equanimity? So before I read you the juicy paragraph here, this is what we are all wondering. <laughs> this is why I really love this sutra. It's why I wanted to teach this sutra. So you've heard it. You've probably heard something like this, and you've probably had the exact same question. It's this idea of not not seeing a mind. What doesn't see a mind? Did everybody kind of get that? That's the Bodhisattva's question, because Manjushri said, I, I, I don't even think about generate Bodhicitta. I didn't bodhi generate Bodhicitta. I'm not generating Bodhicitta because there is no mind in that way. And he says, I see no mind to generate Bodhicitta. So the Bodhisattva, who's really smart, asks, what doesn't see a mind? Right? And he basically answers by saying, or, or because the question is worded, what is that which doesn't see a mind? And Manjushri answers, that which doesn't see a mind is called equanimity, upeksha. So then the Bodhisattva asks, okay, what's upeksha? <laughs> because that would be my question. <laughs> if, I, if I were the Bodhisattva there, I would ask the same thing. So now let's read the answer. And I'm just going to read mine at this point, but it's pretty much the same, but it's certain words that it's the language that I use. So what is being explained as equanimity? What is this? Manjushri replied saying, noble one, equanimity such as this is so called because all the various kinds of natures are entirely without existence and all the various phenomena all the various dharmas are described as being of a single flavor that which is described as being of a single flavor is without defilement or purity is neither fleeting nor permanent, is neither arising nor ceasing, is without self and without possession, is neither grasping nor letting go. Dharma explained like this does not think I explain and is without differentiation. Noble one, to cultivate practice within an understanding of this equanimous dharma is what is called equanimity. Furthermore, if bodhisattvas enter this equanimity, there is no seeing there being all the different realms, whether they are one or many. No seeing equanimity within equanimity no seeing opposition within opposites by the purity of their original nature. And by the way, at this, the Bodhisattva thunderous voice said to the Buddha, world honored one, Manjushri won't tell us how long ago he generated Bodhicitta, but we all want to know. <laughs> So well, let's dissect the, that paragraph, but I just wanted you to know it ends kind of on a funny note. So the equanimity that Manjushri is speaking about is this, you know, he defines it as this single flavor that all phenomena, all dharmas are described as being of a single flavor. So this single flavor idea, I really want to tell you because I know that 
a lot of people that come to Dharma doors or that listen to Dharma doors, I know that you're serious Dharma students. And so I want you to know that this language of a single flavor of all phenomena or all dharmas, that everything has a single flavor. That's a very particular metaphor or, or idea. And the one sutra that it is really associated with is the, it's called the Samdhinya Mochana Sutra. The Samdhinya Mochana Sutra is considered the mind only uh, sutra. So if you've heard of Yogacara Buddhism, if you've heard of the mind only school of Buddhism, the sutra for the mind only school is a sutra called the Samdhinya Mochana. It's sometimes called um, the sutra revealing the hidden meaning. One of the, let's see, one of the better translations of it, though, is actually this little book called Buddhist Yoga, translated by Thomas Cleary. You can see it's not a very long sutra. This is a very misleading title. What he's referring to is the Yogacara school. But it's in this very important mind-only sutra that the Buddha talks about all phenomena or all dharmas having this one same flavor and what's yo know, yeah tanya had to find the my cat was sitting on the mouse kind of funny sorry um is that i've heard is that like the yoga of one taste yeah. i've okay all right it's actually usually referred to as one taste but as far as I understand it, taste is a verb and flavor is what one tastes. So the, the normal translation of a single taste is a little grammatically incorrect, but it's the same idea. And what that idea is, by the way, is so this eka, what is it? Rasata, eka rasata this one flavor. So the, what they're talking about or why they would mention this, they're talking about or they're, they're referring to this idea that I'm always talking about, which is the idea of characteristics. Things being what they are based upon these different characteristics. And last week, I think it was, I think I walked us through this one where I was using my, my little cup. And this, so let's talk about the characteristic of this and the characteristic that it's little. So the idea is, is that if I had my, my cups and i said um if i was showed you these and i said hand me the little one how like the idea is is that given the choice you would probably choose this one because this is the little one and so the, the littleness is the characteristics that distinguishes it from this one. And it's tempting to think that the little is a characteristic of the, like owned or possessed by this. And that big, the, like if I said, give me the big one, you'd give me this one. And what the idea is, is that what I showed you, I think last week is, is that if I put it next to this one, this isn't the big one anymore. Because if I said, give me the big one, you wouldn't give me this one anymore. You'd give me this one. Because now this is the big one, or sorry, this is the big one. So what we begin to notice is that this 
is neither big nor small. And if you're following me, you understand that this has no size. It has no size. It can be big, can be small, but unto itself, it doesn't have a size. Last week, I also talked about which one is the lighter one? Which one's the light colored one? Is this the light colored one? Are you sure this is the light colored one? Because this one looks lighter than this one. So this is now the dark one. So chromatically speaking, this is dark and this is light. But wait a minute, I thought this was the, so now the size isn't here, the color isn't here. And then, as I mentioned last week, even thinking that this is a cup is relative to my mouth, relative to all these other things, whereas it could be a hearing aid, it could be a little hat for your man bun, it could be a lot of things, depending upon how it's being used. So now, this doesn't have the characteristic of size. This doesn't have the characteristic of color. It doesn't even have the characteristic of being a cup. The idea here is, is that within the realm of the Dharma, and in the realm of dharmas, the, the realization is that all phenomena are lakshana-less. All phenomena actually don't have characteristics. Yet, it is by virtue of characteristics that we know what things are. So the idea is, is that if you understand that all phenomena are like I'm describing, then you could then say, as I just did, that all dharmas, all phenomena lack characteristics. And in their lacking of characteristics, they all share that one characteristic. So they all have the same flavor, the Buddha says. All dharmas, all phenomena have the same flavor. And that idea of all phenomena having the same flavor is this idea of equanimity or upeksha. So, my point now is that the Mahayana Buddhist idea of equanimity, it's gone quite a bit further than just putting up with upstairs neighbors. <laughs> because in the original form of Buddhism, Upeksha was very much about not being angry at anybody, not, that was the idea. The idea was, it was very related to Kashanti and this idea that Upeksha was this really even keeledness about other people. Whereas in the Mahayana tradition, this idea of Upeksha begins, it's, it's applied to all phenomena, to all dharmas in that way. And that, well, that at least was a very long explanation of this language of the single flavor. Everybody okay with that? Yeah, Tanya. So, so it's like, so all phenomena lack lakshana characteristics, but they kind of share which, so they, would you say they, this, I kind of laugh in saying this, but they share the characteristic, they all share the characteristic of being characteristicless, which is equanimity. Or would you just say, get rid and just say they all share 
this single flavor of equanimity. And, mm-hmm. and should I just like not bother? Cause it's just like, <laughs> I don't know. So I have to tell you that the Buddha in the, in the Samdhinir Mochana Sutra that I mentioned, the Buddha talks about all dharmas having this single flavor. What that single flavor is gets spoken about a number of different ways. So my point is, is that I wouldn't want to equate it entirely just with Upeksha. Okay. So the idea is, and let me do, everybody okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jenny. Mm -hmm. Is single flavor another way of saying non-dual? Excellent. 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 Such a great connection because we did the talk on non-duality, I think, two Sundays ago. Exactly. So that all phenomena are non-dual is that single flavor that mm, one another aspect of the single flavor that some of you might be familiar with is the idea that all phenomena are such tathata, meaning not big or small, but so, (laughs) but such. (laughs) So there's a lot, a lot to this idea of the single flavor, but the one important thing that connects it to Upeksha, it's about that idea that you're kind of looking at everything And it's all on a very equal playing field. Nothing is great, but nothing is terrible either. It's the beauty of Upekshas, this idea that, oh, and I wanted to bring us back to the sutra anyways. So it mentions that, this is the sutra, by the way, that which is described as being of a single flavor is without defilement or purity. So this is that non-dual idea too, Jenny, about neither good nor bad, neither defiled nor pure. And this is a, and I got to tell you, like from very personal practice point of view, this is something that it's so slippery because what it is is, is that when you say, like, you know, neither defiled nor pure, there's, a, or, you know, like, um, or another way to put it is neither good nor bad. Another way to put it is neither evil nor good. Now, when we first hear this, there's a way in which our mind is still stuck in a dualistic point of view. And so it, it might hear, wait, I have to accept evil as good? No, 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 no. That is not what we are talking about. Because we are talking about neither evil nor good. And if you kind of hear that you have to accept evil as good, then you're, you're still doing it. It's actually about neither nor, for example, so neither defiled nor pure, neither neither impermanent nor permanent. You could hang out with that one for a very long time. How could some, how could this cup be neither impermanent nor eternal and permanent. Like, what would that even mean? That would be upekshik, to see it as neither permanent nor impermanent, neither is pretty nor not pretty, right? Neither nor in that way. Neither arising nor ceasing, which we've already done quite a bit, 
and then all these others, neither with or not with the self, not with possession, neither grasping nor letting go. And that's a really important one for Buddhism, of course, because of this idea of relinquishing attachments. So letting go, being attached, clinging, or letting go. This says neither attached nor letting go. So all of this, this sort of much deeper bodhisattva type of upeksha is very related. Awesome comment too, by the, by the way, Jenny, very related to non-duality, very related to anupatta, the non-arising talk I gave last week. But my point is, and because it's basically time, I want to kind of start to bring this to a close. But my point is, is that so much of this is about how we are perceiving the world. And I started with, you know, my this and this idea of getting excited about it, but then examining that the excitement isn't out here. It's about the reaction to it and recognizing that somebody could have a totally different reaction but then we go even deeper to basically to, and I haven't said it tonight, but what we were getting at was emptiness via our conversation about characteristiclessness. But the idea is, is that when you tap into this idea of the characteristiclessness of things, all of a sudden, if you understand that this one is neither big nor small, neither light nor dark, and it's neither a cup nor not a cup in that way. When you're in that mode, the idea of grasping at the cup or letting the cup go, those are both diluted ideas from what we've been talking about tonight. Because they would be still diluted that there is this cup here that I could be attached to, or that I could let go of. But we just talked about how this upeksha, neither attached nor letting go in that way. So, all right. So that means that next week, we're going to hear from the Buddha about how the Bodhisattva Manjushri generated bodhicitta. I would stay tuned for that. <laughs>